do look at the camera, look in the lens, if you want, because that's where your eyes mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. um, So to start off with, if you can just tell me your name and who you are. Oh, who I am, my mm -hmm. goodness. My name is Marie Robertson. Uh, who am I? God, I'm a... Um, I'm a lesbian, I'm a therapist, I'm a community developer, I'm a mom, I'm a partner, I'm a friend, I'm a senior LGBT activist, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator, I'm lots of things. And I know you had mentioned in your email that um, senior issues are what you see as sort of the big things to be dealt with in our communities and a big issue that you Um, for me, uh, a, an important issue in, in my life, and I'm not saying this is the issue for the queer community, but an issue that's important to me that has, I think, emerged quite organically in my life is what's going to happen to us as seniors or what is happening to us as seniors. I have been an, um, an activist in the LGBT movement for 40 years, at least 40 years. And to me, at this point, I'm, actually I'm turning 59 in a couple of days, um, and what's happening now for me organically is to look at long-term care facility, facilities, um, services for seniors, and so I'm part, I am the community developer for the Ottawa Senior Pride Network, and that's a part-time contract that I have. And so that's a two-fold thing, and that's about developing community, so uh, that's, that's what I'm paid for. So it's about creating a, a sense of pride within the senior LGBT community here. We marched in Ottawa's Pride this year for the first time as an organization, although the Dykes from Sage have marched for years and uh, the gay guys in Prime Timers have marched for years as well. But this was the first time that Ottawa Senior Pride Network has marched together and we were very well received. It was amazing. So part of it is we held a huge conference uh, here in Ottawa in June of 2010 called Taking LGBT Aging Out of the Closet. And we had 65 LGBT seniors there. And out of that conference came subcommittees, interest groups, and we have uh, some very active ones right now. And one is called Social Spaces Committee. So there's a group of people who are looking at spaces to get together socially for LGBT seniors because we frankly we don't want to go to loud bars anymore and it was one thing when I was old enough to be people's mothers but now that I'm old enough to be their grandmother it's a bit thick like I'm just not interested in doing that anymore so we have we run a bar t two uh, Wednesday nights a month and we've been doing that since last winter we're about to have a big holiday party in December and the, the turnout has been quite amazing we regularly went for Ottawa for Toronto that would be a whole different ball game but for Ottawa we get regularly 25 to 30 people out, which is really quite, and mix men and women, so it's, it's pretty darn exciting. And we're going to be meeting again in November to look at other things that we want to do in the community. Um, we had a, pr a presence at Pride Committee, um, which I was the chair of, and so that was all organizing around this year's Pride in Ottawa, making sure that we not only marched, but that we had an information booth at the fair. And it was a really a, a fun march for us because many of us have been marching most of our lives. And so we made, a lot, we have a banner, Ottawa Senior Pride Network banner, but we also made our own signs, just like we used to in the old days, you know, with the wood and the poster board and made them ourselves. And they were beautiful, absolutely beautiful, flamboyant and sequins and great colors. We're a very vibrant community. Um, and so it, when I'm saying that organically, this is the next issue for me, Myself and my peers of my age group, we were we are the gay liberation generation. So before us, a lot most people were in the closet. So we were those young upstarts in the 70s who started the movements and started the first groups on campus in different cities in this province, and then came together. I was at the founding conference of the Coalition for Lesbian and Gay Rights in Ontario, that was held in Toronto. So we were all representing our groups, and we you know some of us are dead. Um, lesbians and gay men are, are dead, um, but some of us are still around, and so we're not certainly going to go into go into the closet to go into care if we have to go into care. And I think what we bring to this, so so we have another project called Seniors Helping Seniors, 
And so what we, we at this point, we, we are creating a, a, a group of LGBT volunteers who are interested in the Seniors Helping Seniors Project. And we are partnering with a, a group here called the Good Companion Senior Center. And we will be doing a bit of our own pre-screening and some training and then sort of handing over the names and contact information for about, you know, well, who knows? Well, we're going to have our first meeting of C40 and see who, who, who sticks with it. But we're creating a roster of LGBT senior volunteers who then will be able to go through, get their police checks, done up, further training done at Good Companions, and then they'll be available. So when an LGBT person calls in and needs friendly visiting, help with grocery shopping, whatever, accompaniment to appointments, they will have the option of requesting an LGBT person. So that seniors helping seniors, and the other piece of, of so there's the Pride Committee, there's, we tried an intergenerational group, which didn't sort of, there wasn't enough interest at the time. We are going to pick that up again. So we'll see what we're going to do with that. Part of my job as community developer is also to contact all seniors services and centers, community centers in Ottawa, introduce our project, introduce myself, and then we can go in and do training. So we have, we're very fortunate here that there's a lot of us old timers in Ottawa. So we have a training group. There's myself, Kathy Collette, Donna Monroe, Barry Deeprose, Bill Stoby, and, and you could, like the creme de la creme of training. We've been doing this forever. So we're starting. And so we already getting gigs. Like I'm doing another one on Monday on my birthday. We're going to go, I think it's the Ontario Association of Older, older senior centers or something. It's a, it's a conference that we're getting to go to. So that will increase as I send out the, the introduction letter to introduce our project out in the community. And then the next piece we want to do is train more LGBT seniors so that we don't have to keep doing all the training ourselves, right? So it's a huge project. Um, and that's sort of the community development part and part of the training. The, this, Ottawa Senior Pride Network, the overall network, is also made up of us and representatives from seniors' organizations. So certainly the Good Companions, Housing, Ottawa, the City of Ottawa Housing. We also, fortunately, we have someone from the Canadian Cancer Society who just joined, uh, First United Church, Interfaith Council. It's a huge group of people. So that has representatives from agencies and old queer people and also representatives from queer agencies. I also work with LIX, Lesbian Information Exchange, and we have uh, about 470 members here in Ottawa, lesbians. We just did a survey monkey on our membership. The vast majority of our membership are 40 and up, mostly between 40 and 60, but we certainly have members 60s, 70s. So I sit as, I, I also used to represent LIX on that particular agency committee and someone from SAGE and Prime Timers. So it's a very vibrant group of people. And that's about going into services and long-term care facilities again and doing training. Because as you probably know if you interview people in Toronto around this issue, it's incredibly homophobic. And th we have to take some responsibility for going in and doing assessment and training. Absolutely. So I went, just before I moved to, back here to Ottawa in 2004, I just, I was working with, um, Dave, what the heck was it? No, Dick Moore from the 519, and um, a woman from Sherburne, forgetting her name. And we were just starting to do some of that training there. So I, w I was at a training session at Fidger House on Sherburne. So Toronto's a, just a bit ahead of us on that stuff, but absolutely it's the same kind of stuff. And there are movements happening also in Vancouver and in Montreal. Great work by Bill Ryan. And so this is an issue that for queer people my age, it's just, it makes sense to us. It's like, okay, absolutely, we are not going to go into the closet to go into care and or even to have pe home care workers come into our homes if we decide to stay at home and be at home as long as we can. So we have to also start accessing CCAC workers. So it's a huge, I mean, you think it's a massive undertaking, which you people will benefit from <laughs> no, when you get to be my age. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty darn exciting. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about Is that Lori Rothstein? No, it was a woman of color. Michelle? Clark? Maybe? I think so. I don't think she's there anymore. 
Should we be, should probably be off doing some other really exciting exactly. project. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so you mentioned that you guys have attempted an intergenerational group, but that for some reason it didn't work. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about intergenerational um, elements of our community. Are we intergenerational? How can we better sort of bring in youth and elders into our communities? So just about that experience, why the intergenerational group didn't work. We attempted to do an intergenerational group after the conference in June of 2010 because that was one of the groups that came of seniors. There were seniors who said, we think it's really great to connect with youth and we have lots to teach and they have incredible energy and it could be a, a, a lovely thing to have happen here. So, so that started from the seniors community. So we contacted Pink Triangle Youth here um, and we set up a meeting at their space at their space we went to pink triangle services and we had a facilitator from our group and we, we were really looking forward to having seeing what they had to say and what we could offer and projects and, that we could work on together and none of them came so we had to look at that at, at we're old and the way that we've learned to do political organizing over the years is you you get a space you call a meeting and you let people know and they come and then it happens right so we had to look at that. That's perhaps not the way to access uh, queer youth. I'm trying to be optimistic that they, they, they are going to be interested. I don't know. Um, so that's as far as we got at this point. So we went with, of all, this, all the interest groups that, that came out of the conference, and there probably were 10. We only have energy to do with where people have energy, right? Because if you've worked with the volunteers, it's you've got to, what, what people want to do and where they have energy and where they have a fire in their belly and that just wasn't one of the projects that worked for people or sparked energy in our community. That's not to say we're not gonna continue with that because I think there is interest and I think there is interest on, on, from both sides on that. Yeah. And we've just had recently in Ottawa a suicide um, that has just shaken the community here, 15 year old boy who, who is the son of a city councillor here um, so there, there was a vigil this week, and in fact, I think there were two, and it, there's a lot of talk happening around the bullying issue, and I can see where that's the kind of issue. This, this community's been quite shaken by this. Um, so we'll see that's pulled in energy from lots of different organizations, and that's been going through all the Facebook groups here in town, and people are signing petitions, and I think it's unfortunately those kinds of crises that you know will bring people together, and that's... I think that's a, a plate. I mean, bullying happened when I was in school, you know, 45 years ago. So that's that's not a new thing. Yeah. It's unfortunate that we still have.
And I think what's, from my perspective, when young people are calling themselves queer who don't have a fucking clue, have never experienced any oppression, don't know what that means and have no sense of history, don't know anything about it, I find that personally offensive. It's like, excuse me, that's my word. You don't get to use it. I'm getting old and crabby, you know. Oh, oh. I find in doing community organizing in the senior LGBT community, I try, I try to use both. So, and I, I know some of my volunteers have trouble with their word career, and I'm trying to, you know, get them used to that. I'm, I'm decided I'm going to reclaim it, you know, just because I get tired of saying LGBTQ. I'll just say LGBTQ, but that, that's about as far as I'll go. You know, it's just, it's annoying. I liked queer because for a while it was just easier. But now, who knows what it means, and so I don't use it with the same positive sense, I guess, you know. Um, so when talking about history, you had mentioned both AIDS and feminism. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, uh, so you call them both valuable pieces of our history that we mm -hmm. need to sort of learn and educate mm -hmm. ourselves from. Um, I'm wondering if you could pick an example from each, either a, a, an issue or um, something that that was changed by either AIDS or feminism that is still pertinent to us now. So for example, for feminism, um, do we still need the same discussions of sexism and gender, or are we past that? I think for me it's a very different thing. It informs the work I'm doing today. So how does how, how does my experience as a feminist and as a, an early gay liberationist affect the work that I'm doing today? How does that come together for me? And here's an example. My boss, so I, my little project, my little one day a week job, is funded, is it run through Centertown Community Health Center here, which is sort of the closest thing we have to a, a gay center in, in town. And my boss is a straight woman who's a, an ally. She's amazing. And she says to me, when I go in for my little meetings, she'll say, I, I'm constantly blown away, Marie, by how organized you people are. Because as I, our project is just one community development project that she's in charge of. So there's a whole bunch of different communities, whether those are based on race or ethnicity or whatever. And she's used to having to teach people how to do community organizing. How, what, is a what does community engagement mean? What does cultural competency mean? You have a right here. And so she's, having to, she's used to having to spend more time up front helping people get organized and that they have a right to organize in the first place. And then we sort of just come barging in and I'll just say, Christina, this is what we're doing. And she doesn't, you doesn't have to, never mind micro, she has trouble just even managing me because we, we've got amazing ideas and we're off. We know how to do them. We know how to do things on little or no money because there was no money then, right? We're, I talked to you about a Seniors Helping Seniors project that we have going and we're trying, you know, we're going to do it through the channels and put, send these volunteers over to the Good Companion Senior Center to go through that program. In the meantime, before that ever happened, there's a longtime activist here in town, Denis, who you're going to be interviewing, and he just called me last December and said, I, I, Marie, I need help. I need help. I went over. You know, I have enough connections. I have enough experience doing this. We did care teams with AIDS work before, when the, when the food trays were still out at, on, left in the halls at Toronto General Hospital. And people were dying at home. And we made that happen for people. And we helped them. And so to set up a care team for this man, and to call, and this is a man, I mean, Denis is a founding father of, of uh, Gays of Ottawa here. He's highly respected in this community. People are honored to come. They're honored to be one of his visitors. So we were able to set up a care team for him, doing everything from sh snow shoveling to grocery shopping to taking him to his doctor's appointments to hanging out with him at home quite easily because been there, done that, we have the experience and because he's so highly respected. We take care of our own. We learn to take care of our own as, as women in the feminist movement and especially in the gay movement and especially around AIDS. 
And I think the AIDS movement changed the medical profession as we knew it before, changed what advocacy means, changed what patients' rights mean, access to clinical trials, access to medication and treatment. And the medical establishment has not been the same since. So we were able to bring our experience as feminists and gay liberationists into the AIDS movement and make that different. And so we're all the same people. And now we're working on this issue. So when I said to you earlier in this interview, this is, a, this is quite organic for me. It truly is. It wasn't like I sat around thinking, she's I don't have anything to do. Uh, wh what should I do now? It, there's the issue, let's go. There are people who are in care now who had straight volunteers from senior centers going in to do visiting at home who ran screaming back to their coordinators saying, that guy's got porn there. I mean, this guy's gay. Did you, how dare you send me into a house, see that senior gay guy, right? This issue is just in our faces because we're, old, we're getting older, right? So to me, it's just all that wealth of knowledge moves forward, moves forward, moves forward, and, and, we, and we bring it. We bring it all together. And so it's interesting when you say sort of unpack it, unpeel it, talk about it from that perspective. It's kind of hard to do that. And I mean, Nick, I mean, the, the man who's this is doing that you're doing this for, I've known for a gazillion years, I've known for decades, but he's always, you know, he's been the academic, not that he's not been out on the street, but he, uh, he, you know, he's also got that academic piece. I'm a working class woman. So it was always about from the streets, the, from the streets up and what was practical. And I would be the voice in the meetings that if they got too academic, I'd say, I got to back you up here. I, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. So probably for decades, people have said to me, no, you should, Marie, you should write. You should write down stuff. Like it's amazing. You should be writing this stuff down. It's like, I'm just doing it. I'm not reflecting on it. So even when you ask me these questions, sometimes it's hard to reflect on it because it just is. It just was. You just do what you need to do. I've been able to take some of my work, working with dying people, working with people with AIDS, into this, uh, a more mixed straight gay community and here when I first got here I volunteered at two hospices because I was building my practice there and there were no gay people and there were no people with AIDS where are they like what's going on in this city right it's it's very different here um, so I found some advantage so I did some work with Bruce House as well but then I also taught for two years at Algonquin College and I taught in palliative care because what we learned uh, through the AIDS movement in, in terms of palliative care and in terms of advocacy needs to be taught. Absolutely needs to be taught. So I always felt as a teacher because right from get-go day one, hi, I'm Marie, I'm your lesbian teacher here. This is, this is where I'm coming from. This is how I'm going to teach you this at cultural competency and LGBT issues, of course, have to be part of that program for me. So I always felt that, yes, I'm teaching them palliative care, but I'm also politicizing these people. Because it's that I can't, I can't do anything else. That's just I've never been in the closet, so I, I, I wasn't even an issue for me. I thought, okay, should I, should I tell them? I, I've just never not told people. So, yeah, I don't know if that makes any sense to you whatsoever. It but does. okay. It does make sense. Um, yeah, I, I think you're the first person who's drawn that parallel um, between AIDS activism women and lesbian communities caring for gay male communities. Um, and now our seniors. And yeah, that's an interesting connection. I've never thought of that before, but you're right. We are equipped to do this work already. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what is the current climate for seniors? What do you mean the current climate? So you're trying to make changes for LGBT seniors. So what is, how are se LGBT seniors currently living? You talked about having to go back to the closet for care, for example. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can just provide some I think because of homophobia, LGBT seniors, some are not accessing care at all. So they don't feel comfortable to call one of the senior centers and ask for a friendly visitor, or ask to participate in the, in the grocery bus program. I, I, so I think, and we're just starting to get some st statistics on this stuff. So part of, you know, or Th they're not make, and, and I'm not judging them for this. They're not making a point of who they are. They're go they're going to into care, 
and they may die in care. So the last years of their lives, they're not being able to live authentically. And that makes me crazy. Couples are split up, you know, but straight couples get, cut, get split up too, but they try to do more. We have, for instance, here's an example. Um, so if, it, if an older gay man who's part of a, of, of a couple is in care, what will happen, and this is again the pre-liberation generation, what will happen is the partner will come and visit, but the relationship is invisible. Nobody knows that's his life partner. They'll say, actually say things like, isn't that nice, he's got a friend who comes so often. If they don't touch each other, We've got couples who, if they want to be affectionate, go into the bathroom and close the door to hold hands. That's not the way it should be when you're in your final, in your golden years and as you're dying. And who, you know, and so, did you happen to see dying at Grace? It's in the, it's, it's a film that was made at the Grace Hospital in Toronto by, um, I'm telling you, I'm having a senior's moment. Alan, Alan, he made Walden, what the place was his name? You know who I mean? And one of the couples died. It's the most amazing film about death. And I went to the screening because I was dating this woman who's a filmmaker, so I got into, to go to that early. And everybody else was filmmakers, and just I was the palliative care worker. And when I said, it was so moving and so the best thing I've ever seen. Anyway, I told him that, which seemed to mean a lot to him. But there was a gay couple in that, an open gay couple in that, and that's how it should be. And yes, that man's mom and dad were there as well, but his partner was the primary partner, visible and recognized and respected as the primary partner. And we fought for that very much with AIDS work because most of it was younger people dying of AIDS. The older generation don't feel they have that right, and it's not that we're trying to force it on them. If they want to stay closeted, that's the generation, they came up that way. When I was your age and an activist, older lesbians were saying to me, my dear, don't rock the boat. Things aren't that bad, right? And so they thought I was crazy then, right? So I'm just as crazy and I'm bringing that now into seniors work and it just makes me insane to think that somebody should have to suffer that way. So it's just, it's just not gonna happen. I'll be, this is the issue I'll be working on for the rest of my time probably, because I, I can't foresee it. It's gonna start to change. We had a great response to that. We trained the staff already at the Good Companion Senior Center and they're amazing. And of course you, you do training and you start to talk to them. And yes, the executive director, one of her best friends is a gay guy. And this one, the coordinator of this program's group, young girl, she, well, she grew up with Uncle Bob and Uncle Kevin, who cool, right? I mean, they all know gay people and that's different. Right? That wouldn't have happened 40 years ago. Now, because of the changes in television stuff and movies and the movement, and blah, 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 it is better and people are talking more about it. But we're talking about a generation of older LGBT people who grew up totally closeted. But I still don't think they should have to suffer and I want to offer them options. And when somebody goes into care and it's an old guy and he fills out that stupid application form that says, first of all, male, female. I mean, you know, some of us don't define that way. Everything has to be changed. Where is the gay flag in the, or the, you know, the, the rainbow flag in the lobby? The, if an older guy goes into care, the staff will say, well, you'll certainly have no shortage of partners in, in the dance, you know, the dance at our Saturday afternoon dance. Well, why? Because there's hardly any guys there. Assumption of heterosexuality. That all has to change. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, we don't think of our grandparents as somehow actually, whether they're gay or straight. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the sort of desexualization of age. Um, that yeah, it's sort of, you wouldn't have an active gay man in an elder's home because men at that age don't have sex anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that sort of crossover between. Mm -hmm. um, so I think generally speaking, the, the, the desexualization of seniors is a, a huge issue, for sure. And if, yes, older people have sex. But also, it's not just about sex, it's about intimacy. It's, a, it's about being comfortable to lay down in that bed with that person, to hold their hand, to kiss them, to, to, to caress them. So it's not, about, it's not just about sex, it's about intimacy and affection and comfortability in expressing that.
Well, and of course, and love. So I think we've had quite a great conversation. Mm. Is there anything else that you think, for the purposes of this film, that we should know about you, about the work that you do, about your family? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I'd like you to talk to me about, and then I'll see if I have anything to talk sure. to say about it. Uh, was sort of that you know whole disagreement we had over email about qu queer liberation as theory and how does gay yeah. liberation inform that and yeah. you know which I said to you like frankly I don't have time like I'm busy changing the world Take over here world, yeah. so w like what is the hope here what I what is the the goal of this research where is Nick heading with this so I think for us what we're trying to do is develop a queer liberationist theory so differentiating issues for queer people from the issues from gay and lesbian folks, like we were talking about before, that uh, in, in gay liberation, it was about access to certain legal rights that were nece necessary for equal living. And for equal well, it was access. basic human yeah, rights. Yeah, for basic human rights. Which you got to sort of start there, yeah. or, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so Custody now, rights, lesbian moms. I mean, they're pretty basic yeah. issues. Yeah. So now we're looking more at liberation and less at assimilation. So what you had talked about of, of being critical of marriage because it's a, a, an institution that you don't necessarily see queers as, like we're not gaining much for, by, by joining marriage. Um, so yeah, essentially what we're trying to do is theorize queer liberation as somehow separate from gay and lesbian liberation, but connected to it, that queer is the next step okay. in our... It's the progression. Yes. The progression the, of where, where it's going. Mm -hmm. Because nowadays, one of the things that, that is about our society is that it's no longer a gay or a lesbian thing. It's bisexuality, it's gender differentiated, differentiated situation. Mm -hmm. okay. It's all those things, and they encompass so many more things. And, and people in our society now feel that they were left out mm -hmm. um, in that movement. And going forward... Left out in what movement? Left out of the early gay liberation yeah, movement. Uh, they were there, but Absolutely. they were never mentioned. They were never talked about. Um, so that sort of whole realm of diversity that didn't didn't uh, exist because it wasn't talked about. It wasn't brought forward. So there's a whole there's a whole um, you know realm of difference that's coming up with our younger generation, especially, um, and the fact that. For instance, you know, you're lesbian, period, that's it. But you can still be queer and lesbian. So we're not trying to do that. But what we're trying to do is join all the forces together. And it's not, we're not trying to do this. It's just something that's happening in our society. And, and this is how we see this going forward. So what we want to do is sort of take everyone's perspective on this and, and to get to an end there and show everybody that you know, basically what it is is it's making our society stronger. Um, it's defining us as as a, as a society of queers rather than a society of gays or just lesbians. And then, okay, well, you're bisexual, so you don't really fit in here. Um, you know what I mean? So it, it's it's taking everything and joining joining it all together, mm -hmm. but at the same time, letting everybody keep their own ownership of who they are. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how many of us are. Many of the people we interview who are working together very strongly in the, or in, in the queer movement mm -hmm. see it as, as what mm -hmm. it is. And, and basically, nobody is, is saying what it is because it defines itself. Any movement defines itself. Right. It's, it's a combination of people doing things, and it goes forward, and then it gets labeled. And it gets labeled because of what's happening, who they are, and how, how things work. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're doing. So we're not trying to say it's this or that. Mm -hmm. It's it's people telling us how they feel about it, mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing an overall movement of that happening. You know, especially with the younger generation. Really? Yeah. Okay. And I think that's part of the reason why some of the younger generation feel disjointed with the older generation because we've had many uh, in the interviews say, you know, it's a gay movement. It was always.
always be my own. I see this queer thing. I don't know what this queer thing is. So you know, there's mm -hmm. there is a bit of a of a, of a of a rift there. Right. And and there should be. It doesn't have to be because really, we're we're embracing what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. But we want to go forward. We want to go forward as a society. We mm -hmm. don't want to go forward as somebody who's just gay. You know, because that's not really what it's like. You said it yourself. We are different. We are better. You know, why is it that we're not considered the normal and that the others, the heterosexuals, are the ones who have less to offer? Because, you know, the reality is is that there is something there for us. And we want to we wanna take it forward with that kind yeah, of perspective. That's really helpful. I, I, I think what's really the challenge is there's different kinds of challenges. And I think that if, because I'm gay liberation generation, but because it, it, I've always I mean, I continued. It's not like I stopped after, you know, they changed the Human Rights Code in Ontario in 1986. So keep moving forward. And then, and so th the movement grew to include bisexual people, in, in gr grew to include trans people. And then, and not just transsexual, but, but also transgender. And what does that mean? And what's that spectrum? And it's true, I think, that some older gay people felt we were losing something, or wait a minute, you can't do, what do you mean, that's, we're, th those aren't our issues. But I think that's the minority. I think that those of us who started this work in 1970 are radical people and who, ha who had lived the experiences of, of losing jobs, of being thrown out of our parents' homes, um, n n losing apartment. I mean, it was, it was, being beaten up. It was horrible. And we used to have marches in Toronto in the old days. The police would come on horses and push us against the walls going up. I mean, it was, people hated gay people. Would, to, to come out in a time in the early 70s, late 60s, and that's why the, with seniors who were in care now, God, we were sick, we were criminals, we were mentally ill. The, the hatred it was it was a very different kind of thing, and I'm not trying to trivialize thing, like the fact that that young boy killed himself here, not, but it's different. The the general Joe Blow has had the opportunity, and my brother is a Joe Blow. Let me tell you, they've had the opportunity. They've been exposed to Ellen on TV, Rosie O'Donnell, the films, the movements, everything happening, people coming out. So it's better. It gets better. It gets better. And so the, I think the Joe Blow public is not as hateful as they were when, when I was your age. But we were still the radicals. So, that, so the majority of gays and lesbians were saying to us, shut up, shut up. Why are you making so much noise? Don't rock the boat. So, and then as things got better and more people came into that movement, more gay people came into that movement, they were, they, what they wanted was very different than what I wanted and what Ricky Babu fought for. They wanted to be able to get married, to be like straight people. That's not who I am, and that's not who I'm sure a lot of the people, that's certainly not who Denis is. I mean, I'm sure a lot of the people you're going to be interviewing are old timers who ha are very different than the, and than the queer people living in the suburbs here in Ottawa. That's not who we are. What I see is one of the challenges, and in, in ha so having an openness, it's so, to, to, so that queer means more than, than gay and lesbian. Yes, there's tons of educational work still to be done on the bayou, for God's sake, never mind trans issues. Absolutely, that's ongoing work. My concern is that young people don't differentiate themselves. So they're going to straight bars, and they say, well, why would I need a gay bar? They don't see themselves as different. That's my concern, that when we talk about what it was like, or what we want, we still, I still have this need to, I need community, I need mirrors, I want to be with other queer people. I can take yoga classes with straight people, but you know, I need, my family's got to be queer people. The young people don't seem to need that in the way that I need that, because the world is a different place, and so they say, what's the big deal? So the fact that they didn't show up for our intergenerational meeting here in Ottawa, I have to ask myself, part of it is, Maybe it's just not of interest to them. And that's okay, because if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. 
but they don't go to the gay bars. It, there's not, it's, it's a very, very different time where, and that's what I think is one of the challenges is that loss of that unique identity in young people, as well as the conservative older people who just wanted the right to get married and move to the suburbs, right? So one of the things that my partner Lucy and I ha have done is we adopted uh, a child through Ottawa Children's Aid here. Great. But the movement of, we are such sore thumbs in that community because vast majority of lesbians and gay men who are, for them that's really radical to adopt a child as an openly gay couple, but they're incredibly conservative people. So I remember having a bizarre discussion about pride coming up and some woman saying, well, I hope no, I hope there's not a bunch of people there in leather because I'm certain, I don't know if I should bring kids and my partner saying well I oh I guess I won't wear my chaps this year then and they all went <gasps> we realized really early on that and we had to find we have found other queer parents who sort of are like-minded souls thank God but again it's sort of part of they got married and now they can adopt children too that's really and it's lovely great that's not what queer movements about for me great go do that and have fun and play bridge with your straight neighbors but that's not who I am so I don't want to come across as really negative about what some conservative gay people are doing but, but you know you're, you're right on what you say and part of part of the reason why I feel so strong about the movement is because heterosexuals forever have tried to erase us yep. and they've tried to erase us by doing exactly what you're saying fit in you know you're not going to like it but you have to fit in and we don't want to hear about your fear whatever you and that's private, and that, that's the kind of attitude yeah. that makes the young feel that way. You know, the reality is, is that they need to get together. They need to realize yeah. what's in their soul and, and who we are. And then it does happen, it comes out. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we can't give up on them. Yeah. And you know, you do see it. I, I, we see it with the young kids in the groups in the schools. When they do come out and when they try to be more open and more different, that's when they get the taunting and they, and they name calling, and that's what makes them not want to do it. Yeah. So it, it, it's it's kind of a struggle, and they don't even realize it's happening, but it's there. But I want to ask you a question as a trans person. What I find frightening is young female to male trans people or transgender people who are then, bye bye, they're finding the little girl. And and and, bec and becoming a heterosexual couple, and in some cases a kind of right wing heterosexual couple, that scares the crap out of me. These are not politicized transgender people. Their image of what it's like to be a guy seems to be like the '50s asshole. Yeah, there's a lot of diversity in transgender people. Yeah. 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 A lot. still have people taking their own lives as a result of mm -hmm. being bullied in school. And, mm -hmm. um, yet, we nevertheless are continuing to place value in schools as like, well, no, this is where we send our kids so that they can get their social mm -hmm. education, and yet... Mm -hmm. you know, I think... One of the ways that I think that tr uh, that the project that, that really helps with that particular issue in Toronto, which I was in, involved in from the outset in Toronto, is the Soy Project. Um, and we don't have anything like that here. People are talking about, wouldn't that be a fantastic idea? Absolutely. You know, there's so many, so many people who are going to start organizing things. But that, I think the Soy Project in Toronto helped bring, I mean, just by the very nature of it, and I mentored three kids. And so just, just by the nature of that, it brings together the generations. And we don't have something like that here yet in Ottawa. But I think it would be a fantastic idea. Yes, yeah. This boy had just put up posters in his school for a gay straight alliance and they were torn down and 
that d that seemed to be what put him over the edge. Well, the thing is, too, is that because of social media, we've got all these these terms and these you know things that heterosexuals say, and they don't even realize. Oh, exactly. Mm -hmm. And they do it online. They do it on Facebook. They do it everywhere. Goodbye. <laughs> So you had mentioned um, when we started that um, the generation of folks who are working on these seniors' issues mm -hmm. are the generation who were gay liberation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about some of your experiences um, from 40 years, 30 years, 20 years prior, mm -hmm. um, and perhaps how they relate to today's struggles. Jeez, oh, three, six, six, it was such a long time ago. Um, it, was a, it was a very different time in the sense that the number of us were so small that so we, we could have an Ontario conference and we all knew each other because there were hardly any people there and we would always have that's how the you know lesbians we wanted to have our own separate caucus and we would do that so you know I knew Chris Birch we all knew each other so it was a very tight group and because laws hadn't been changed yet they're very different issues I think when you're fighting for basic human rights it's different than fighting for I mean I don't have a I never had a fire in my belly for equal marriage frankly I'm not interested in being able to get married it's not an institution that appeals to me I question the whole validity of the thing in the first place um, but that's very different than losing your job or your housing because you're gay so I think the, the I, I, it's interesting because when I first started on the soy project in Toronto um, part of that interview was to talk about experience in, in the LGBT community and it was, and we, I remember talking with with uh, Bev about that. It was a very different time because all the bars were in basements. Everything was closeted. You, people were terrified to come out because you, there was no. They could just say, "You're a lesbian. I'm firing you." I was involved in a case of discrimination in Kitchener Waterloo in 1974, which the strategy in those days was make a complaint to the Human Rights Commission, go public with it, because they were saying, "Well, there's no discrimination. We're not getting any complaints." So that was the political strategies were make noise, make noise. We'd have demonstrations all the time, just to. Sorry, my cat playing with one of your things. Here. No. Ooh. And um, sorry. Oh, an elastic band. Not good for digestion. Yeah. We'll just I love kitties. They get into everything. Well, a bit of a pain in the ass sometimes, <laughs> frankly. Um, Lucille. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um. We're just talking about the old yeah, days. Yeah, the old, so um, the sort of emphasis on, on legal, on, on employment, on housing, and those types of struggles. Um, so you had mentioned that um, the, the recent legal issue of access to marriage is not something that you personally found um, to be a, an issue that you wanted to sort of get behind. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about marriage that m makes it I think around um, the equal marriage issue, the, the, what it brings out, I mean, I think it appeals to a very different part of the LGBT community. It, it, it appeals to, this is a generalization, okay, but it appeals, from my perspective, it appeals to much more conservative part of our community. So the people who always lived in the suburbs and now they just get married. They got married and live in the suburbs, and they're not the people who are necessarily activists back in the '70s and '80s. Some of them were, and I know. I mean, some of my friends have chosen to get married, and God bless them. I mean, that's great. It's just it's not an institution that appeals to me. Um, I was very good friends with Ricky Babu, one of the original members of the Body Politic, and we were together at the AIDS Committee of Toronto, and he. What a loss to our community because he had such an amazing um, ability to just step back and look at in a critical eye. And he talked about that and he wrote about that, how we're losing the critical eye 
that we can, that we have and that we've had historically by sort of assimilating and, and like we're just, I've just never been one of those people who say, well, we're just like everybody else here, except that we happen to, you know, sleep with people of the same sex. That's the exact opposite of what I've always been saying. I think we're very different. There's so much that's different about us in, in, in terms of how we are as individuals and, and how we are as a community. So I didn't want the right to just, to me, it's not just about, okay, so everything's fine and then just go back there and shut up. I'm not look. That's not what I'm looking for at all. So we've lost the critical eye. We've lost the analysis, and I think that's really sad. Um, I think what's important for young people coming up, and I see the energy, and I think it's great. And and I have I have a lot of clients. I'm a psychotherapist here. I have a lot of clients in the of young LGBT people in this community, and a lot of the activists in this community. So. I, I think I'm not totally out of touch with what's happening, and I love the energy and I love the, the analysis. What I think that there, we're in danger of losing, what I think young people need to re, need to have in their minds, is the history, and that everything that we have today that people, old people like me, fought for, we can lose. Absolutely, I have. I don't trust that. Okay, we we did that fight, so we could lose it. In the same way that you know Stephen Harper would love to just make abortion illegal again. I mean. You can't sort of just rest and and hope that 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 fought that fight's finished and so we're we're cool now. I th and I think that oh, people my age also went through the whole AIDS thing and also went through the whole feminist thing in the 70s. And so when when you lose people, a massive amount of loss that we went through is life changing. And so there are young queer people who, they never knew anybody who died of AIDS. They think that HIV is a manageable chronic infection, and what's the big deal? They're, and, the, and the young women are not people who knew what it was like in the 70s when you know, a whole generation of, of women were medicated to keep their mouths shut. There's a really valuable piece of history that I think it's important that young people keep in mind in terms of their new analysis of what's what's going on here. So I'm not I'm not suggesting that. I think young people have to pick their own issues, and it's going to be it's a very different time, and that's that's great. That's for them to do that. I'm afraid of our history being lost, and and then the wealth of knowledge, and the experience that we can teach young people. I think that that's that's a lost opportunity. So it's too bad that that intergenerational project didn't happen right away, and maybe it will down the road, and that would be fantastic. But I have to say that when I was still in Toronto, uh, Dwayne from um, Soy, he was, he's a young man who just loves history and he just thought it was great. And he arranged uh, a project at um, Dennis's studio, that, the gallery that used to be on Maitland, and he's moved now. And it was Fireside Chats. And he, he picked, I spoke, and he had Ricky Bebu, and I think somebody else, and I can't remember. And he arranged these evenings where we're going to come and, you know, he's going to invite the youth and here's your chance, blah, blah, blah. And, like, hardly anybody showed up. It was mostly old people. <laughs> so we just sat around and talked about the old times. But, you know, I had, I had prepared a whole thing, and I know Ricky did as well. And that's too bad. It's too bad that there, there's not the interest there. I'm not judging young people for not having that interest, but what a lost opportunity. We have an incredibly rich history. Oh, Dwayne's great. We met at the, uh, the uh, uh, history, uh, the archives, yes. and we're going through some of the old, uh, uh, yeah. you know, poli body politics. Uh, yeah. So, so he's got plans. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. so, and, and we are trying to get some of the youth. There's a, one of the workers now at Soy yeah. actually came, and she wants to bring her kids and stuff. Oh, fabulous. So, oh. There is hope. Excellent. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite disheartened when I talk to young queers who don't know what Stonewall is. Mm. We, it's just not something that they feel is important enough to learn, and yet nevertheless go and celebrate Pride without realizing what it is that Pride is actually commemorating. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sad to hear that the intergenerational group didn't work out, but that there are nevertheless these other attempts being made about sharing information between our elders and our youth that the youth has something to teach the elders and the elders have something to teach the youth and that, mm -hmm. that conversation is so important. Yeah. Um, it's just not happening. It's not happening in Toronto either, unfortunately. Mm. We're having a hard time sort of, yeah, the, having the old speak to the new. And mm -hmm. I think part of the problem is this word queer. Um, that 
some members of the older communities do not like the word queer, seem somewhat hesitant to embrace the word queer. It's like, no, this was a gay and lesbian movement, mm -hmm. um, and queer is something new, something somehow separate. Mm -hmm. um, so what is queer for you? What does queer mean? I, pr I probably use, I could use queer in interchangeably with, with lesbian. I don't refer to myself as a gay woman. I mean, that's, I think people in Sudbury do, but you know, I mean, the part of it's geographical. So I will use queer inter, inter, interchangeably. I don't know what queer means anymore, to tell you the truth. So, for instance, I'll give you an example. I'll have a new client come in, and I'm an out dyke therapist, so. And say it's an example, young woman who defines as queer. So I'll say, so what, what's queer? So are you, so you're, are you a lesbian? No. Oh, are you, are you a bisexual woman? So what, what does queer mean to you? Uh, well, I'm actually in a relationship with a man, but I consider myself queer. What the fuck does that mean? Right? So I find, and so that's challenging. I mean, in my role as therapist, that's like, that's a totally different thing. But as an activist, I have to say, that pisses me right off. And as the LGBTQQQQ123 add an S for straight on the end, when I heard that one, I thought, oh, please, give me a break. So I, and I think what's, from my perspective, when young people are calling themselves queer who don't have a fucking clue, have never experienced any oppression, don't know what that means and have no sense of history, don't know anything about it, I find that personally offensive. It's like, excuse me, that's my word, you don't get to use it. I'm getting old and crabby, you know? I agree with you. Oh, pfft. <laughs> I find in doing community organizing in the senior LGBT community, I try, I try to use both. So, and I, I know some of my volunteers have trouble with the word queer, and I'm trying to, you know, get them used to that. I'm, I'm decided I'm going to reclaim it, you know, just because I get tired of saying LGBTQ. I'll just say LGBTQ, but that, that's about as far as I'll go. You know, it's, just, it's annoying. I liked queer because for a while it was just easier. But now, who knows what it means, and so I don't use it with the same positive sense, I guess, you know. Uh, so when talking about history, you had mentioned both AIDS and feminism. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, uh, so you call them both valuable pieces of our history that we mm -hmm. need to sort of learn and educate mm -hmm. ourselves from. Um, I'm wondering if you could pick an example from each, either a, a, an issue or um, something that that was changed by either AIDS or feminism that is still pertinent to us now. So for example, for feminism, um, do we still need the same discussions of sexism and gender, or are we past that? I think for me it's a very different thing. It informs the work I'm doing today. So how does, femi how, how does my experience as a feminist and as a, an early gay liberationist affect the work that I'm doing today? How does that come together for me? And here's an example. My boss, so I, my little project, my little one day a week job, is funded, is it run through Centertown Community Health Center here, which is sort of the closest thing we have to a, a gay center in, in town. And my boss is a straight woman who's a, an ally. She's amazing. And she says to me, when I go in for my little meetings, she'll say, I, I'm constantly blown away, Marie, by how organized you people are. Because as I, our project is just one community development project that she's in charge of. So there's a whole bunch of different communities, whether those are based on race or ethnicity or whatever. And she's used to having to teach people how to do community organizing. How, what, is a what does community engagement mean? What does cultural competency mean? You have a right here. And so she's, having to, she's used to having to spend more time up front helping people get organized and that they have a right to organize in the first place. And then we sort of just come barging in and I'll just say, Christina, this is what we're doing. And she doesn't, she doesn't have to, never mind micro, she has trouble just even managing me because we, we've got amazing ideas and we're off. We know how to do them. We know how to do things on little or no money because there was no money then, right? We're, 
I talked to you about uh, Seniors Helping Seniors project that we have going and we're trying, you know, we're going to do it through the channels and put, send these volunteers over to the Good Companion Senior Centre to go through that program. In the meantime, before that ever happened, there's a longtime activist here in town, Denis, who you're going to be interviewing, and he just called me last December and said, I, I, Marie, I need help. I need help. I went over. You know, I have enough connections. I have enough experience doing this. We did care teams with AIDS work before, when the, when the food trays were still out at, on, left in the halls at Toronto General Hospital. And people were dying at home, and we made that happen for people, and we helped them. And so to set up a care team for this man, and to call, and this is a man, I mean, Denis is a founding father of, of uh, Gays of Ottawa here. He's highly respected in this community. People are honored to come. They're honored to be one of his visitors. So we were able to set up a care team for him, doing everything from sh snow shoveling to grocery shopping to taking him to his doctor's appointments to hanging out with him at home quite easily because been there, done that, we have the experience and because he's so highly respected. We take care of our own. We learn to take care of our own as, as women in the feminist movement and especially in the gay movement and especially around AIDS. And I think the AIDS movement changed the medical profession as we knew it before, changed what advocacy means, changed what patients' rights mean, access to clinical trials, access to medication and treatments. And the medical establishment has n not been the same since. So we were able to bring our experiences as feminists and gay liberationists into the AIDS movement and make that different. And so we're all the same people. And now we're working on this issue. So when I said to you earlier in this interview, this is, the, this is quite organic for me. It truly is. It wasn't like I sat around thinking, geez, I don't have anything to do. Uh, wh what should I do now? It, there's the issue. Let's go. There are people who are in care now who had straight volunteers from senior centers going in to do visiting at home who ran screaming back to their coordinator saying, that guy's got porn there. I mean, this guy's gay. Did you, how dare you send me into a house, see that senior gay guy, right? This issue is just in our faces because we're, old, we're getting older, right? So to me, it's just all that wealth of knowledge moves forward, moves forward, moves forward, and, and, we, and we bring it. We bring it all together. And so it's interesting when you say sort of unpack it, unpeel it, talk about it from that perspective. It's kind of hard to do that. And I mean, Nick, I mean, the, the man who's this is doing that you're doing this for, I've known for a gazillion years, I've known for decades, but he's always, you know, he's been the academic, not that he's not been out on the street, but he, uh, he, you know, he's also got that academic piece. I'm a working class woman. So it was always about from the streets, the, from the streets up and what was practical. And I would be the voice in the meetings that if they got too academic, I'd say, I got to back you up here. I, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. So probably for decades, people have said to me, you know, you should, Marie, you should write. You should write down stuff. Like it's amazing. You should be writing this stuff down. It's like, I'm just doing it. I'm not reflecting on it. So even when you ask me these questions, sometimes it's hard to reflect on it because it just is. It just was. You just do what you need to do. I've been able to take some of my work, working with dying people, working with people with AIDS, into this, a more mixed straight gay community and here when I first got here I volunteered at two hospices because I was building my practice there and there were no gay people and there were no people with AIDS where are they like what's going on in this city right it's it's very different here um, so I found some advantage so I did some work with Bruce House as well but then I also taught for two years at Algonquin College and I taught in palliative care because what we learned uh, through the AIDS movement in, in terms of palliative care and in terms of advocacy needs to be taught. Absolutely needs to be taught. So I always felt as a teacher because right from get-go, day one, hi, I'm Marie, I'm your lesbian teacher here. This is, this is where I'm coming from. This is how I'm going to teach you this at cultural competency and LGBT issues, of course, have to be part of that program for me. So I always felt that, yes, I'm teaching them palliative care, but I'm also politicizing these people. Because it's that I can't, I can't do anything else. That's just I've never been in the closet, so I, I, I wasn't even an issue for me. I thought, okay, should I, should I tell them? I, I've just never not told people. So, 
Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense to you whatsoever, it but does. okay. It does make sense. Um, yeah, I, I think you're the first person who's drawn that parallel um, between AIDS activism and like women and lesbian communities caring for gay male communities, um, and now our seniors. And yeah, that's an interesting connection. I've never thought of that before, but you're right. We are equipped to do this work already. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what is the current climate for seniors? What do you mean the current climate? So you're trying to make changes for LGBT seniors. So what? You, how are LGBT seniors currently living? You talked about having to go back into the closet for care, for example. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can just provide some context on what needs to change for seniors. Okay. I think because of homophobia, LGBT seniors, some are not accessing care at all. So they don't feel comfortable to call one of the senior centers and ask for a friendly visitor, or ask to participate in the, in the grocery bus program. I th so I think, and we're just starting to get some statistics on this stuff. So part of, you know, or th they're not make, and, and I'm not judging them for this, they're not making a point of who they are. They're, go they're going to into care and they may die in care. So the last years of their lives, they're not being able to live authentically. And that makes me crazy. Couples are split up, you know, but straight couples get, cut, get split up too, but they try to do more. We have, for instance, here's an example. Um, so if, it, if an older gay man who's part of a, of, of a couple is in care, what will happen, and this is again the pre-liberation generation, what will happen is the partner will come and visit but the relationship is invisible. Nobody knows that's his life partner. They'll say, actually say things like, isn't that nice, he's got a friend who comes so often. If they don't touch each other, we've got couples who, if they want to be affectionate, go into the bathroom and close the door to hold hands. That's not the way it should be when you're in your final, in your golden years and as you're dying and who, you know, and so, did you happen to see dying uh, at Grace? It's an. All right. It's a, it's a film that was made at the Grace Hospital in Toronto by. Um, oh my God! I'm telling you, I'm having a seniors moment. Nice. Alan, nice. Alan. He made Walden. Th what the Grace was his name? You know who I mean? Yeah. And one of the couples died. It's the most amazing film about death. And I went to the screening because I was dating this woman who's a filmmaker, so I got into to go to that early and everybody else was filmmakers and just I was the palliative care worker and when I said it was so moving and so the best thing I've ever seen anyway I told him that which seemed to mean a lot to him but there was a gay couple in that an open gay couple in that, and that's how it should be and yes that man's mom and dad were there as well but his partner was the primary partner visible and recognized and respected as the primary partner and we fought for that very much with AIDS work because most of it was younger people dying of AIDS. The older generation don't feel they have that right and it's not that we're trying to force it on them. If they want to stay closeted, that's the generation, they came up that way. When I was your age and an activist, older lesbians were saying to me, my dear, don't rock the boat. Things aren't that bad, right? And so they thought I was crazy then, right? So. I'm just as crazy and I'm bringing that now into seniors work and it just makes me insane to think that somebody should have to suffer that way. So it's just, it's just not going to happen. I'll be, this, will, this is the issue I'll be working on for the rest of my time probably because I, I can't foresee it. Ch it's going to start to change. We had a great response to that. We trained the staff already at the Good Companion Senior Center and they're amazing. And of course you, you do training and you start to talk to them. and. Yes, the executive director, one of her best friends is a gay guy, and this one, the coordinator of this program's group, young girl, she, well, she grew up with Uncle Bob and Uncle Kevin, who cool, right? I mean, they all know gay people, and that's different, right? That wouldn't have happened 40 years ago. Now, because of the changes in television stuff and movies and the movement, and blah, 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 it is better, and people are talking more about it, but we're talking about a generation of older LGBT people who grew up totally closeted. But I still don't think they should have to suffer and I want to offer them options. And when somebody goes into care and it's an old guy and he fills out that stupid application form that says, first of all, male, female. I mean, 
you know, some of us don't define that way. Everything has to be changed. Where is the gay flag in the, or the, you know, the, the rainbow flag in the lobby? The, if an older guy goes into care, the staff will say, well, you'll certainly have no shortage of partners in, in the dance, you know, the dance at our Saturday afternoon dance. Well, why? Because there's hardly any guys there. Assumption of heterosexuality. That all has to change. I wonder how this might relate to the way we desexualize our elders mm -hmm. generally. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, we don't think of our grandparents as sexually active, whether they're gay or straight. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the sort of desexualization of age. Um, but, yeah, it's sort of, you wouldn't have an active gay man in an elder's home because men at that age don't have sex anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that sort of crossover between. Mm -hmm. So I think, generally speaking, the, the, the desexualization of seniors is a huge issue, for sure. And if, yes, older people have sex. But also, it's not just about sex, it's about intimacy. It's, a, it's about being comfortable to lay down in that bed with that person, to hold their hand, to kiss them, to, to, to caress them. So it's not, about, it's not just about sex, it's about intimacy and affection and comfortability in expressing that. Well, and of course, and love. Think that yeah. Just because we're gay, all we want to do is have sex. Yeah. Just half the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we've had quite a great conversation. Mm. Is there anything else that you think, for the purposes of this film, that we should know about you, about the work that you do, about seniors? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I'd like you to talk to me about, and then I'll see if I have anything to talk sure. to say about it. Uh, was sort of that you know whole disagreement we had over email about qu queer liberation as theory and how does gay yeah. liberation inform that and yeah. you know which I said to you like frankly I don't have time like I'm busy changing the world yeah, over here yeah. so w like what is the hope here what it, what is the the goal of this research where is Nick heading with this so I think for us what we're trying to do is develop a queer liberationist theory so differentiating issues for queer people from the issues from gay and lesbian folks, like you were talking about before, that uh, in, in gay liberation, it was about access to certain legal rights that were nece necessary for equal living. For equal well, it was access. basic human yeah, rights. Yeah, for basic human rights. Which you got to sort of start there, yeah. or, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so Custody now, rights, lesbian moms. I mean, they're pretty basic yeah. issues. Yeah. So now we're looking more at liberation and less at assimilation. So what you had talked about of, of being critical of marriage because it's a, a, an institution that you don't necessarily see queers as, like we're not gaining much for by, by joining marriage. Um, so yeah, essentially what we're trying to do is theorize queer liberation as somehow separate from gay and lesbian liberation, but connected to it, that queer is the next step okay. in our... It's the progression. Yeah, it's the progression of where... where because nowadays, one of the things that, that is about our society is that it's no longer a gay or a lesbian thing. It's bisexuality, it's gender differentiation. Mm -hmm. It's all those things, and they encompass so many more things. And, and people in our society now feel that they were left out mm -hmm. um, in that movement. And going forward... Left out in what movement? Left out of the early gay liberation yeah, movement. Uh, they were there. But Absolutely. They were never mentioned. They were never talked about. Um, so that sort of whole realm of diversity that didn't, didn't uh, exist because it wasn't talked about. It wasn't brought forward. So there's a whole there's a whole um, you know, realm of difference that's coming up with our younger generation, especially, um, and the fact that queer liberation. liberation movement isn't trying to take away anyone's um, uh, you know, owner, ownership of who they are. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know, you're lesbian, period, that's it. But you can still be queer and lesbian. So we're not trying to do that. But what we're trying to do is join all the forces together. And it's not, we're not trying to do this. It's just something that's happening in our society. And, and this is how we see this going forward. So what we want to do is sort of take everyone's perspective on this and, and put, the, put it out there and show everybody that you know, basically what it is, is it, it's, um, it's 
it's making our society stronger. Um, it's defining us as, as, in, as a society of queers rather than a society of gays or just lesbians. And then, okay, well, you're bisexual, so you don't really fit in here. Um, you know what I mean? So it, it's, it's taking everything and joining, joining it all together, mm -hmm. but at the same time, letting everybody keep their own ownership of who they are. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how many of us, are, many of the people we interview who are working together very strongly in the, in, in the queer movement mm -hmm. see it as, as what mm -hmm. it is. And, and basically, nobody is, is saying what it is because it defines itself. Any movement defines itself. Right. It's, it's a combination of people doing things, and it goes forward, and then it gets labeled. And it gets labeled because of what happens, who they are, and how, how things work. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're, we're all about. So we're not trying to say it's this or that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's people telling us how they feel about it. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing an overall movement of that happening, you know, especially with the younger generation. Really? Yeah. Okay. And I think that's part of the reason why some of the younger generation feel disjointed with the older generation. Because we've had many uh, in the interview say, you know, it's a gay movement. It was always a gay movement. I don't see this queer thing. I don't know what this queer thing is. So, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there is a bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a rift there. Right. And, and there shouldn't be. It doesn't have to be. Because really, we're, we're embracing what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. But we want to go forward. We want to go forward as a society. We don't mm -hmm. want to go forward as somebody who's just gay, you know, because that's not really what it's what. You said it yourself. We are different. We are better. You know, why is it that we're not considered the normal and that the other the heterosexuals are the ones who have less to offer? Because, you know, the reality is is that there is something there for us. And we want to we want to take it forward with that kind yeah. of perspective. That's really helpful. I, I, I think what's really the challenge is there's different kinds of challenges, and I think that if, because I'm gay liberation generation, but because I, I've always, I mean, I continued. It's not like I stopped after you know they changed the human rights code in Ontario in 1986. So keep moving forward, and then and so th the movement grew to include bisexual people, in, in grew to include trans people. And then, and not just transsexual, but but also transgender, and what does that mean, and what's that spectrum? And it's true, I think, that some older gay people felt we were losing something, or wait a minute, you can't do, what do you mean, that's, we're, th those aren't our issues. But I think that's the minority. I think that those of us who started this work in 1970 are radical people, and who, ha who, had lived the experiences of, of losing jobs, of being thrown out of our parents' homes, um, n l losing apartment. I mean, it was, it was being beaten up. It was horrible. And when we used to have marches in Toronto in the old days. The police would come on horses and push us against the walls going up. I mean, it was, people hated gay people. Would to, to come out in a time in the early 70s, late 60s, and that's why the, with seniors who were in care now, God, we were sick, we were criminals, we were mentally ill. The, the hatred, it was, it was a very different kind of thing. And I'm not trying to trivialize thing, like the fact that that young boy killed himself here or not, but it's different. The, the general, Joe Blow has had the opportunity, and my brother is a Joe Blow, let me tell you. They've had the opportunity they've been exposed to Ellen on TV, Rosie O'Donnell, the films, the movements, everything happening, people coming out. So it's better, it gets better, it gets better. And so the, I think the Joe Blow public is not as hateful as they were when, when I was your age. But we were still the radicals, so, that, so the majority of gays and lesbians were saying to us, shut up, shut up, why are you making so much noise, don't rock the boat. So. And then as things got better and more people came into that movement, more gay people came into that movement, they were, they, what they wanted was very different than what I wanted and what Ricky Babu fought for. They wanted to be able to get married, to be like straight people. That's not who I am and that's not who I'm sure a lot of the people, that's certainly not who Denis is. I mean, I'm sure a lot of the people you're going to be interviewing are old timers who ha are very different than the, than the we're people living in the suburbs here in Ottawa. That's not who we are. 
what I see is one of the challenges and in, in so having an openness so to, to so that queer means more than than gay and lesbian yes there's tons of educational work still to be done in the by for God's sake never mind trans issues absolutely that's ongoing work my concern is that young people don't differentiate themselves so they're going to straight bars and they say well why would I need a gay bar they don't see themselves as different that's my concern that when we talk about what it was like or what we want we still I still have this need to I need community I need mirrors I want to be with other queer people I can take yoga classes with straight people but you know I need my family's got to be queer people the young people don't seem to need that in the way that I need that because the world is a different place and so they say what's the big deal so the fact that they didn't show up for our intergenerational meeting here in Ottawa I have to ask myself part of it is maybe it's just not of interest to them and that's okay because if it's going to happen it's going to happen but they don't go to the gay bars. It, there's not. It's it's a very very different time where, and that's what I think is one of the challenges is that loss of that unique identity, in young people, as well as the conservative older people who just wanted the right to get married and move to the suburbs, right? So, one of the things that my partner Lucy and I ha have done is we adopted uh, a child through Ottawa Children's Aid here. Great. But the movement of, we are such sore thumbs in that community because vast majority of lesbians and gay men who are, for them that's really radical to adopt a child as an openly gay couple, but they're incredibly conservative people. So I remember having a bizarre discussion about pride coming up and some woman saying, well, I hope, so. I hope there's not a bunch of people there in leather because I'm certain, I don't know if I should bring kids and my partner saying well like oh I guess I won't wear my chaps this year then and they all went <gasps> we realized really early on that and we had to find we have found other queer parents who sort of are like-minded souls thank God but again it's sort of part of they got married and now they can adopt children too that's really and it's lovely great that's not what queer movements about for me great go do that and have fun and play bridge with your straight neighbors but that's not who I am so I don't want to come across as really negative about what some conservative gay people are doing but, but you know you're, you're right on what you say and part of, part of the reason why I feel so strong about the movement is because heterosexuals forever have tried to erase us yep. and they try to erase us by doing exactly what you're saying fit in you know you're not going to like it but you have to fit in and we don't want to hear about your, your whatever you and that's private, and that, that's the kind of attitude yeah. that makes the young feel that way. You know, the reality is, is that they need to get together. They need to realize yeah. what's in their soul and, and who we are. And then it does happen, it comes out. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we can't give up on them. Yeah. And you know, you do see it. I, I, we see it with the young kids in the groups in the schools. When they do come out and when they try to be more open and more different, that's when they get the taunting and the, and the name calling, and that's what makes them not want to do it. Yeah. So it, it, it's it's kind of a struggle, and they don't even realize it's happening, but it's there. But I want to ask you a question as a trans person. What I find frightening is young female to male trans people or transgender people who are then, bye bye, they're finding the little girl. And and and, be, and becoming a heterosexual couple, and in some cases a kind of right-wing heterosexual couple, that scares the crap out of me. These are not politicized transgender people. Their image of what it's like to be a guy seems to be like the '50s asshole. Yeah, there's a lot of diversity.
looks like you two are certainly, you're, you've got a fire in your belly, that's mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs> We're moving forward, and that's really delightful. Uh, and that's why we want to do this project is, yeah, to, to gather those elements of history that our youth are not learning, mm -hmm. um, and to present them in a way that's interesting and captivating, um, so that our movement's moving forward, we don't make the same mistakes twice, because we've learned from our history, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, like you said, that there are things that we've learned that we're now really, really good at. Mm -hmm. And that because we're really good at those things, we should use those skills moving forward. So we yeah. should use the caretaking skills that we've learned during the AIDS movement. We should use that collective organizing and doing something with nothing that we learned mm -hmm. from feminism. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those things are, are fundamentally important. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I see so much of is the fact that we have so much there's mm -hmm. so much, so much talent. Oh, yeah. It's incredible, it's funny. eh? Yeah. It really is. To, you know, to see you and others, you know, that do so much. I mean, you said it yourself. People look at you and think, how do you do so much? Yeah. You get things done. <laughs> so, yeah, mm -hmm. that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I am done on my end. Is there anything else that you wanted to... No, it's been, it, I've really enjoyed yeah. this. I didn't think I was going to, frankly. It's been a nice conversation. That's the problems with email, eh? It it's is. Like, I hate email. Yeah. You can't detect tone, and it's like, are you, yeah. you know, how flexible is this? Well, and, and I think yeah. also, I'm just becoming a crabby old lady, and you know, when you say to me, I'm not going to study to do an interview. Yes. Excuse me, you either yeah. want to talk to me about my life, or you, or know, you, know. you don't want to talk <laughs> to me. Yeah. If you're not the first, then, I mean, we, we did tell you know, great things to get that you realize <laughs> He wants to use it on Well, but sometimes, you know, you just need to give him a slap. That's all I say. Um, the last thing that you were saying about, it's interesting, I remember reading an article about a trans woman who was running for office in Florida. Um, and there were lots of trans people who were like, great, a trans woman's running for office in Florida. And then you read about this woman's politics, and she's anti-gay. She is like the most conservative trans mm -hmm. woman ever, mm -hmm. who religiously has justified her existence as a trans person, but her Bible says that, exactly. that gays and lesbians are bad. Yeah. So it's like, well, just because the person is a trans person and they're running for office doesn't mean that they're one of ours. Like. Well, it's like, uh, how, can, you know, how can you be queer and be a conservative oh. in this, or a, or, or a black Republican? Like, what? Because <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. yeah. You're unconscious. They're unconscious. Yes. They must what can you do? Blinders. Or something. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and you're for so inviting welcome. us into your home. Yeah. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yay! I think we're done. Yeah. Ooh. Support myself, and it's fun. I remember when I started my degree in sexual diversity studies. Everyone went around me and said, "What are you going to do with that?" Yeah. I was like, I'm going to study my community for the rest of my life. That's what I'm going to do. Ah. I'm going to make our lives better. I'm going to, yeah. yeah, like this is what I want. And I consider it quite a privilege to be able to go to school oh, and absolutely. to learn about my communities. Yeah. Um, and I've got the, the sort of academic way of looking at things that Nick has, um, but also have the experiences of being a queer person growing up in, you know, the suburbs, moving to Toronto. And, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, just seeing young queers around me not knowing their history and not not learning mm -hmm. why it is that they can walk down the street holding their partner's hand without worry. And, that, and that's part of the issue too, it's the heterosexual society. They're, they don't care. They don't want to help bring it forward. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the difference is. But I think we, we have come to a point now where people will listen. Mm -hmm. And they'll listen and then once they understand it, it becomes easier. Mm -hmm. And that's where we still can't give up. We have to continue, yeah. we have to continue the battle. And that's where the battle is. It's interesting. The only time I ever refer, I have ever referred to Lucy as my wife because she's not my wife, is I go to a, a fitness thing. I have uh, osteopenia, so I have to, I have to deal with not getting osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. So I have to do weight bearing stuff. So I've been doing that for a few years, and I'm in this group with a bunch of older, other middle aged women. They're all straight. And Lucy started coming. I convinced her to start coming because it's a pretty good class. And that's the only time I, I use it for political things. I'll say, oh, guess what, girls? My wife's my joining wife's the class. <laughs> then the one, the first time she came and said, this is my wife, Lucy. Because I don't use, it's, it's a meaningless term to me outside of using it as a political thing in a straight, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
I actually was, I was legally married. I jumped on the same sex marriage bench. Did you really? All divorced now. Uh, but it was the same thing. My partner was American, and so whenever we crossed the border, it was how how are you guys related? We are married. We are wives. Yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> like, yeah. We're making this as public as we can right yeah. here in the border. But otherwise, we don't use those words. Exactly. Like, she wasn't my wife. That's a, that's weird. Yeah. Like, and if she called me wife, I'd smack her. Like, oh. No, don't oh. tell me that. Mm. I'm not your possession. Exactly. <laughs> cool.